This video is made possible by Squarespace. This is roast chicken. Available at most local grocery stores, it's the flesh of a dead bird, heated enough to denature the proteins and char and caramelize many of the starting chemicals. Or, as you'd probably just say, delicious and cooked through. But if I were to ask you what it was made of, you might be a bit confused. Chicken is seen as a base ingredient, so the idea that it's made of component parts feels weird. If you were to reply that it's made of muscle, fat, bone, and connective tissue, I'd reply, well, what are those made of? One step down, and you're forced to just start listing off a gargantuan list of chemicals, proteins, minerals, and metals. And very quickly, it starts to sound like your Edward Elric reciting the ingredients for an alchemical transmutation. What's that? It's all the ingredients of the average adult human body, down to the last specks of protein in your eyelashes. But when you talk about the taste of chicken, how many of those ingredients are actually necessary? Your sense of taste can't actually discern every single ingredient, and lots of the chemicals that may be present exist below the threshold you can taste, so aren't worth worrying about. So if we combined all the chemicals individually, and a source of protein, then cooked it, would we get the taste of chicken? Not only is the answer a resounding yes, the results may actually be better than the original. And the chemistry is so easy, it's not only something you can absolutely do and try at home, I encourage you to do so as it is truly delicious. But you're not going to need to take my word for it. We ran a double-blind taste test with some of my friends, which you'll see later, and I think it really shows just how good this stuff is. The idea started when I noticed that my favorite cheap brand of ramen wasn't actually made of real chicken, and I wondered how that was even possible. This led down a long rabbit hole that ended in US patent number 3689289, titled Chicken Flavor and Process for Preparing the Same. Let me read you some snippets from the patent. In accordance with the invention, an artificial chicken flavor composition is provided, which is capable of developing the flavor of chicken when heated in the presence of water for 5 to 10 minutes at temperatures within the range from 60 to 90 degrees Celsius. Accordingly, this composition is well suited for use by, quote, a housewife who merely heats it at the time of use and then can use it at once without any need for storage after the chicken flavor has been developed. It probably doesn't come as a surprise that the patent was originally filed in the 60s. But because of that, the information contained within is now in use by practically every food manufacturer in the world. Because of this and related patents, the secret of making meaty flavors has been well understood for decades, and it delights me to share these arcane secrets with you. When I first tried the recipe straight out of the patent, I was shocked at how good it was. Ooh, mm, that one's really good. But it did take a little bit of messing with it to make it truly amazing. And it felt like I had just found the recipe for something you shouldn't be able to make, like a recipe for the color red or the feeling of ennui. But when you understand the mechanics, you can shift the flavor to mimic any meaty flavor you want, or just make the best vegetable broth you've ever had. So let's get right into it and see how this works. One of the nice things about biology is that evolution is immensely lazy. If something works well enough, there's not going to be a lot of pressure to change it. Case in point, you share 70% of the same DNA with a banana. If your DNA was only 1% different, you'd be a dolphin. I must speak with the dolphins now. Anyway, the result of this is that most living things on Earth share the same base fundamentals. Proteins, DNA, and various salts. So we have a lot of non-chicken options for ingredients to provide a lot of the base components that are the foundation of the flavor, and then we'll only need to add a few meat-specific ones to fine-tune the taste. In this case, as you might expect, we go with what you'll find in pretty much any vegetarian or vegan meat substitute. Soy protein. Soy protein is nice because it's a pretty bland flavor, but it has a similar amino acid composition to meat. In this case, I'm using defatted soy protein, which I got at the grocery store as textured vegetable protein, though the first step is to detexture it in a blender. Before we go further, we need to talk about the sense of taste and how it works. Since we're trying to recreate a specific taste, having an understanding of how the machinery works is super important, and you will get the bonus of instantly becoming a better chef by understanding this mechanism. Though, if this trick does make you a better chef, you might get so good that you'll want to sell your delicious creations. In that case, you're going to need a website, and for that, look no further than the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. 
Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it super easy to set up a website with their amazing suite of tools and website creation engine. With best-in-class templates and a huge collection of extensions, Squarespace makes it easy to set up the site of your dreams. So head to squarespace.com to start your free trial, and when you're ready to launch your site, go to squarespace.com slash thethoughtemporium to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And of course, there's some links below. Now, back to science. Anyway, the standard story of how taste works is that we only have five types of taste receptor. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami, or savory. This isn't the full reality, but it's a good place to start. We can break those types of taste into two groups. The first group, which includes salty and sour, are detecting changes to the properties of the solution. In this case, sour is detecting pH and salty is detecting, well, salinity. The second group contains the rest of the tastes, and these are looking for groups of specific types of chemical. Sweet is supposed to be detecting sugars, but all sorts of things can set it off that aren't actually sugar. Bitter is typically said to be for detecting alkaloids and things that might be poisonous. And umami is detecting things like MSG and other savory chemicals. Now, the reason I group them like that is because that's actually how it's divided up in taste buds. Your tongue is covered in taste buds, but you can't see them with the naked eye. The little squishy hair-like pads that cover the tongue are papillae, though they often get confused with taste buds. The buds themselves are embedded in the sides of the pads, with anywhere from 3 to 100 buds per papillae, depending on the type. If we look at a single taste bud, we find that it's made of anywhere from 3 to 4 different cell types. And it really does look like a little flower bud, which is where they get their name. Type 3 cells detect sour and salty, type 2 cells do everything else, and type 1 cells are glial cells that help keep the system stable by isolating the different receptor cells and cleaning up neurotransmitters they release. Though each type 2 cell will specialize in one specific type of taste, be it sweet, bitter, or umami. Then there's a basal population of stem cells that replenish the system as the cells get damaged to maintain a healthy taste bud. There's a little pore on the top of the bud that allows a sample of the mixture to enter and be analyzed by the various cells. Depending on which cells are set off, a series of nerves picks up those signals and sends them up to the brain for analysis. Something you may notice is that each taste bud has all of the taste types mixed together. If you're like me, you probably saw this picture in science class, and were taught that the different types of taste were localized to different areas of the tongue. But it turns out that couldn't have been further from the truth. The last part of the classic story of taste is actually smell. As the story goes, all of the sensation of taste is just the ratio of the five different base tastes, and any extra information we get comes from the smell of the components as we chew and swallow. As gas is forced up the back end of the nose, the nose samples it and sends information about the volatile components of the mixture up to the brain. The brain then combines the two streams of data into the sensation of taste. The problem, though, is that if you've spent any time in a kitchen, you might notice that there are some specific things missing in this picture of how taste works. And it doesn't really match the experience of taste. First off, we're missing a few types of taste. These include the detection of oils and fats, and importantly, what the Japanese have named kokumi, or richness. The specific mechanism by which these and some of the other types of taste are detected is still a little bit blurry, but there is enough evidence to point to that we know that these are distinct things the tongue is detecting. Kokumi, or richness, for example, is detecting short, broken pieces of proteins that tend to form when you either cook something for a long time or when things are fermented, which is why those processes make food taste so good. And yes, if you isolate those peptides, you can just add it to food to instantly make it taste rich. But this is also the secret to why things like fish sauce, soy sauce, and other fermented goods or stews and things that have been cooked for a really long time taste so good. The other problem with the classic idea of taste is that it's presented as if the tongue just has five levers, and it's simply measuring the intensity of each. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Instead of levers, I prefer to think of each type of taste as an instrument. Each instrument can play a wide variety of notes and combination of notes, but all are related by the type of instrument playing those notes. The reason for this is because the taste cells are actually much more complicated than the simple picture of their function would imply. First off, the actual protein complexes that are responsible for detecting the various types of taste aren't single entities. 
For example, the complex that detects bitter compounds is called TAS2R, but there are about 25 different TAS2R complexes that we know of that each detect a different variety of bitter compounds. Each bitter detecting cell doesn't express all of the different versions. The distribution also isn't homogeneous across the tongue. Instead, each cell will pick a random few of these to express, so now individual taste buds will be sending much more specific information about what they're tasting. By doing this, the brain can much more easily discern between different bitter compounds, as different compounds will set off different patterns of taste buds across the tongue. And it's much more like the tongue is taking very wet pictures of whatever it's coming in contact with. The brain learns to pick out different chemicals it experiences and mixtures of chemicals from these patterns. On top of that, it's recently been found that not only do taste cells express a heterogeneous population of taste receptors, they also express a heterogeneous population of olfactory receptors as well, which means the same type of sensor that was thought to only be found in the nose. So yes, you're smelling with your tongue. And this is another way that the patterns of taste buds firing are modulated to pull out more information about what you're tasting. Now a cell will fire either when a bitter compound is detected or a specific smelling chemical. So, to bring it back to the music analogy, if each type of taste is an instrument, making something delicious isn't just about balancing the levels of the different tastes, it's mixing and matching notes on the different instruments to make a more cohesive melody. And thinking of it this way is especially necessary if you're trying to fake a particular taste that's as complex as something like chicken. Alright, that's enough background, let's use this knowledge to make some fake meat. The important part to remember is that the goal is to set the reaction up in such a way that when heated, the components make something that tricks your brain into thinking it's meat. So we just need to supply the correct starting ingredients. Think of cooking like blurring the image the tongue is seeing, then raising the saturation. The starting details get lost, but there is an expected outcome. If we just put the right colors in the right spots, after the blur effect, you end up with something close enough to fool your brain. And since most biological matter contains the same stuff, it doesn't take much to tip the flavor towards meat. Here's the recipe that I found worked from the patent, and beside it, my own recipe that I developed after a bunch of testing. They're similar, but there are some important differences. All we need to do is mix the ingredients by blending them together, and the reaction will just happen automatically when we add it either to hot water or when we cook with it. Right off the bat, you can see that we're dealing with salty, sweet, and building a base of umami. Though I find this to be way too salty, so I reduced it. A key detail is that it's important to use glucose, also known as dextrose, for the sugar here, and not ordinary table sugar. It's not only contributing to the flavor, but it's actually at the core of the reaction that generates the meat flavors, so it's important not to substitute. Then we have our texture and protein base in the form of defatted soy protein and some normal wheat flour. We also have a source of fat, and though the patent calls for vegetable oil, in testing I found that flax oil gives the best flavor, as its composition is the closest I could find to animal fat. The last three ingredients are the core of the meat flavor, but you probably don't recognize most of them. These are arachidonic acid, ribonucleotides, and cysteine hydrochloride. Starting with arachidonic acid, this is a very large lipid molecule that is found in two places. meat and brown algae. Since we're trying to make meat, we're going to use the brown algae. In this case, kombu, a species of kelp you can buy at most Asian grocery stores that comes as big dry leaves. Just blend it into a powder and add it to the mixture. I found 3 grams is sufficient for the batch size we're making. Next we have ribonucleotides. This just means shredded RNA. Turns out one of the other chemicals besides MSG that gives umami and savory notes is good old fashioned shredded life essence. But trying to google RNA juice won't turn up anything useful. What you want is disodium inosinate and disodium guanolate. When I was looking for a source for this, I found this sauce. It's made of hydrolyzed wheat, amongst other things, but it's chock full of ribonucleotides and a little bonus MSG. Though you could probably also get away with a small amount of Vegemite for the same effect. Either way, 2 milliliters is sufficient to provide the ribonucleotides we need for the chicken flavor. The last ingredient is actually the star of the whole show, and that's cysteine. It's one of the few sulfur-containing amino acids, and when mixed with glucose and proteins and then heated, will react to form a huge variety of furanthiols and other sulfur-containing chemicals. 
However, after trawling around some other patents, I found that other sulfur-containing amino acids not only can also make meat flavors, but by combining a few of them you get much more complex meat flavors. The way I figured this out was the way we figure out most things in science, enough trial and error to give me soup-based nightmares. So while you're encouraged to experiment on your own, I'll save you a lot of time and just give you the summary of what I found. One gram of cysteine as a baseline is the most chickeny in terms of single amino acids, but going too high on the level and it starts tasting more like vegetables than chicken. Mixing 1 to 1 taurine and thiamine, which is also known as vitamin B1, gives a great beefy flavor. But the best chicken flavor I found by far was a 1 to 1 to 8 mix of cysteine, taurine, and methionine. Methionine gives so much richness and depth to the mixture, but it just isn't chickeny enough on its own. To do chicken, you must have some amount of cysteine. The last add-ons before we get to the taste test aren't mentioned in the patent, but I found helped a lot from my own experimentation. The first is about 5 grams of nutritional yeast, and the second was powdered dried mushrooms. Also, chicken is a very delicate flavor, and so you have to be super precise about all the ingredients. Whereas for beef, you basically just crank up the amount of mushroom, kombu, and switch to taurine and thiamine, and then throw in a bunch of brown flavors. Things like soy sauce, browning, miso, and balsamic vinegar. Playing with different combinations and the levels of the different ingredients will get you sort of whatever meat flavor you want in theory. But that's the science, now let's see how it works in practice so you're not just taking my word for it. Here's how I set up a double-blind trial. I made these coasters that either say fake or real on the bottom. Then I prepared five identical-looking batches of soup. Two of these are homemade fakes, and the other three are different brands of commercially available chicken stock. In this case, boxed, concentrated, and hyper-concentrated paste. These were all used as instructed, so if they said to add a certain amount of water to the concentrate, that was how much I used. I made a master batch of spices and put the exact same amount into five jars of soup, then heated them all in the microwave for exactly three minutes. Then they all were allowed to sit for ten minutes to develop the flavor, before adding browning to balance the color so they all look the same. And finally, they were all adjusted with salt to be as close to the same saltiness as I could get it, and all of the non-fakes were given a quarter teaspoon of MSG so that the fakes don't have an unfair advantage. To really sell the illusion and force the participants to only be able to go by taste and smell, each of the soups was filtered into their respective glasses, and I cooked noodles and some mixed veggies on the side, which could be added to each glass. So that both I can't cheat or accidentally give away the secret, after the glasses were placed in front of the participants, I would turn my back and they were instructed to mix up the glasses. As long as they kept them on their proper coaster, we could find out at the end which were real and which were fake, without either of us knowing during the test. Now you know the plan, so let's get testing. Alright, so the way that this works is you have five soups in front of you. Mm -hmm. And you aren't going to know how many of them are real and how many of them are synthetic. They're all chicken flavored. Um, there will be at least one fake and at least one real. Um, so the first thing I want you to do, um, you have a, a palate cleanser of, of some nice uh, fresh baguette um, and you've got a nice spoon. So all you have to do is first thing, taste all of them and then order them based on which one you think tastes the best. Hmm, okay. I already think this one will be the fakest. That's the latest. Tastes like chicken. They're all gonna taste like chicken, aren't they? <laughs> hmm. Do you use some dill? Yeah. I'm tempted to treat this like wine. Be like that. I'm like, just honestly, like to a certain extent, just basing it on saltiness. Hmm. Can't tell that much difference between these two, so I'm gonna set it this way. It's very watery. Mm. That's the real broth. That's gonna be embarrassing, but... <laughs> They're all good. I don't know. It's pretty tough. I mean, okay, so right now it's just by taste. You're not really looking for the fake, you're just looking for which one do oh. you like. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I kind of did that anyway. These ones I don't like as much. Okay. I don't know which one I like less. That's probably kind of accurate. I'll do a quick test and see. Watch. Right? All right. They're all fake. <laughs> all right, so you're you're happy with that order? Yeah. The, those, I, so that's your that's your preference. So my my okay, but no, but it's this okay, I should say. Mm -hmm. I believe that these are fake. Okay. 
and that these are real, and I put the fake ones in the order that I like them in, and the real ones in the order that I like them in. Okay, now, the really hard bit. Which ones are fake, which ones are real? If you think one is uh, fake, just push it forward a little bit. Fake is the one that you made. Yes, fake, fake is, does not contain any actual chicken. I think these two, at a minimum, are fake. Okay, so you think those two are fake? But these taste like they have chicken in them to me. Okay. These taste so delicious, but I can't actually discern chicken flavor from them. Yeah. That's my Final point. decision? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll start with the one that you like the most, and let's see what that one was. Again, I don't You don't know, know what C is. I honestly okay. don't know what it is. Okay, let's so see. Just lift, so just flip the coaster and show it to the... Well, I mean, have a look. <gasps> hey! <laughs> hot damn! Oh, no. Hey! <laughs> and then show it to the camera. <laughs> All right. So here, just keep it flipped over. Just So that's one fake. So so far, that's that's the the fake has been rated the best and you didn't catch it. Fake. Fake 2. Opposite of what I'm thinking. Okay. Real. Hey, you got a real one. Okay. Nice. Let's see how you did. Hey! Nice! <laughs> Pretty good. Let's see how we did. Look, real. Oh, interesting! Huh. Real? Huh. Fake. <laughs> and real. Very interesting. Okay. You got a real one. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Alright. That's, That's the one I like the least out of the real one. <laughs> Oh no! If these are real, I'm gonna really tell me what brands they are and I'll never buy them. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna. Okay. Alright, now try the. Now, like, flip the last one. No! <laughs> oh no! All told, I'd call this a huge success. And if you give this a try, be sure to let us know what you thought in the comments down below. Since most of the ingredients can only be purchased in larger quantities for actually really small amounts of money, by the time you have everything to give this a go, you basically have enough to make a literal swimming pool of soup. Before I wrap up, you may have noticed the awesome Thought Emporium shirts throughout the video. If you want one, or one of the other amazing designs from our store, there's a link below. Not only do you get to show off your mad science flair, it's a great way to support the show and help us keep making awesome videos like this one. And if you enjoyed these more food-centric projects, check out our second channel, The Taste Emporium. But that's where I'll leave it for now. Thanks, as always, to the amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi who help make these videos possible. Your support is so appreciated, and supporters get access to our private Discord if that's something you're interested in. That's all for now, and we'll see you next time.